This is Laurie Moore Moore with Texas Brave and Strong. Tidbits of Texas history you never learned in school. Today's episode, Bigfoot Wallace, the Mir Expedition, and the Black Bean Death Lottery in two parts. Today, part one, Bigfoot Wallace and the Mir Expedition. Note, before we begin, a reminder that those living in Texas under Mexican rule were called Texicans. During the years of the Republic of Texas, they were Texians. When Texas became a state, they became Texans. On April 21, 1836, Texicans, under the command of General Sam Houston, defeated Mexican troops led by General Antonio Lopez Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. Thus, the Republic of Texas was born. However, by 1842, Mexican troops were making military raids into Texas, hoping that such harassment would discourage both settlement and investment in the young country. In September of that year, Mexican General Adrian Wall captured San Antonio and held it briefly. Texas citizens were outraged. In response, President Sam Houston approved military reprisals against Mexico. A force of 683 Texas volunteers, commanded by Brigadier General Alexander Somerville, mounted attacks along the Rio Grande border, sacking Laredo and taking Guerrero. Concerns about the size and resolve of the force, the limited supplies, and, historians say, a direct order from Houston to abandon the effort, caused Somerville to release his troops and 185 men returned home. Not wishing to disband, 308 volunteers reorganized with new leaders and began the ill-fated Mir expedition. One of the participants was Texas Frontier Ranger Bigfoot Wallace. If you haven't met him yet, find him in two previous podcast episodes, Bigfoot Wallace and the Big Indian, and Attack, Bigfoot Wallace Attacked by Wolves. What follows are two versions of the Mir Expedition, with slight differences in details. This simply illustrates the difficulties historians face when piecing together historic events. It's not easy. First, the Texas State Historical Association's researched version. Two days before Christmas, the volunteer Texians entered Meyer without opposition and demanded supplies. Meyer authorities agreed to provide supplies, promising they would be delivered the following day. The Texians returned to their camp across the river, taking a town official with them as hostage. On Christmas Day, the Texians learned that a large Mexican force had arrived at Mir. Determined to retrieve the promised supplies, the Texians decided to return to Mir and forcefully collect them. The battle raged for 18 hours. Next, Bigfoot Wallace's eyewitness report from the adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, the Texas Ranger and Hunter, written by Bigfoot's best friend, John C. Duvall, from notes provided by Bigfoot himself. Quote, The morning after our new organization, we recrossed the Rio Grande again, eight miles from Mir, and marched at once upon the town, which we took possession of without any opposition. We found no troops there. The inhabitants were quite friendly, apparently, and readily furnished us with such supplies as we needed. We recrossed the river once more and pitched our camp about four miles east of the town. No plundering was permitted while we were in Mir, and everything we took from the inhabitants was duly paid for according to our own estimate of its value, and, of course, the prices were quite reasonable. The next day, after our return to the east side of the river, some of the scouts we had left on the west side to watch the motions of the enemy came into camp and reported that a large body of Mexican troops were marching into Mir. This we regarded as a barter for a fight. 
So we struck tents, crossed the river once more for the last time, and marched on the city, which, as our spies had truly reported, we now found strongly garrisoned by a considerable Mexican force. The battle raged into the second day. Bigfoot's reports continue. He maintains that the Texians were tricked into surrendering. The prisoners were force-marched a great distance through numerous river towns to Monterey. Finally, in the small place of Salado, the prisoners overcame their guards, capturing 97 horses and mules and all their baggage and equipments. They then fled toward Texas, taking turns walking or riding their new mounts. Making the mistake of taking a course through barren, drought-plagued mountains, they were forced to finally kill their exhausted horses for food. They traveled for six days without water, losing 13 men along the way. On the seventh day, 176 were recaptured and with hands bound, force-marched for several days to Saltillo. Imprisoned there, they waited for several weeks for orders from Santa Ana regarding their fate. Let's turn to Bigfoot now for his description of what happened next. In his own words, as recorded in the book, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, Texas Ranger and Hunter. Quote, After a long sojourn at Saltillo, we were one morning roused up by our guard and tried to get ready to march as we were to start that day to the city of Mexico. A few moments afterward, the guard paraded in front of our quarters. We were taken out and formed into a line and marched off on the road back toward Rancho Salado, where some weeks previously we had risen up and surprised the guard under the command of Colonel Barrigan. Handcuffed and bound together in pairs to cut off all chance of our escaping or making another attack upon the guard, we were driven along the road at a gait that would have been killing even to men that were not fettered as we were. On the evening of the fourth day, I think it was, after leaving Sotillo, we came in sight once more of the lonely, desolate Rancho Salado. The officer now in command of the guard, Colonel Ortez, had spoken kindly to us frequently during the day, telling us to be cheerful and walk up fast, for that the sooner we arrived at the city of Mexico, the sooner we would be liberated and sent back home. Notwithstanding these assurances, from the first moment the men caught sight of the dismal old ranch, whether it was the dreariness of the locality or the recollection of what had happened there when we rose on the guard, and of the sufferings and disasters that had followed in the wake of that event, or whether it was some dim foreboding of the bloody scene that was to be enacted there again so soon, that weighed upon the minds of the men, I know not, but not a word was uttered by any one as we trudged along silent and depressed until we reached the hated spot and were once more securely fastened up in the same corral we had occupied before. But a few moments elapsed before an officer, accompanied by an interpreter, entered the corral and, calling our attention, proceeded to read to us from a paper he held in his hand a mandate from the Supreme Government of Mexico ordering the instant execution of every tenth man. Some of the more sanguine among us fully thought the paper contained an order for our release and eagerly crowded around the interpreter to hear the joyful news, but when the report of the writing was explained to us by the interpreter, this barbarous decimation of our number came upon us so unexpectedly that we stood for a moment stunned and confused by the suddenness of the shock. Then a reaction took place, and if our hands had only been unshackled, unarmed as we were, the old Rancho Salado would have witnessed another uprising, ten times as bloody as the first. But when we looked upon our manacled limbs and the serried ranks and glittering bayonets of the large guard drawn up around us, we saw at once that any attempt at resistance would be utter folly, and we quietly submitted to our fate." We'll let Bigfoot describe what happened next in part two of this story. Tune in next time for his first-hand account of the drawing of the black beans. The source for this podcast is Library of Congress, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, the Texas Ranger and Hunter, written by Bigfoot's best friend, John C. Duvall, from notes provided by Bigfoot himself. This book is in the public domain. 
This has been Laurie Moore Moore with Texas Brave and Strong, the best little podcast in Texas. Visit another time and place with my novel, Gone to Dallas, The Storekeeper, 1856 to 1861. It's a historical novel of Texas and a woman's adventure rolled into one. Also, watch for my new novel coming in 2024, Queen of Cotton, Confederate Camel Caravan Across Texas. Thanks for listening. Y'all come back.